morning folks. It's a beautiful day here at Tappanoff Farm in North East Scotland and it's an exciting day because we have BBC Scotland's Beach Grove Garden filming with us again. For those of you who follow you might remember that last year Beach Grove Garden came and made three short films about what Rosa and I get up to in our market garden. Beach Grove Garden is a long-standing Scottish gardening show. It's been on our screens for about 40 years and last year they came and they asked us questions all about permaculture, community supported agriculture, our veg boxes and our market gardening techniques. A lot of you have been asking where you can watch the three video clips that they made and so instead of uploading one of our regular farm vlogs today we thought we'd sew those three clips together and make a trilogy so that you can see what we were getting up to last year. Uh, so a big thanks to the Beach Grove for coming last year to make those videos and a big thanks for them coming today and filming. We'll let you know what that was about at a later date. Uh, but for now, hope you enjoy catching up with last year's footage and we'll be back with one of our regular farm vlogs soon. All right, so take it easy and we'll catch you next time. Today I'm at Rainey in rural Aberdeenshire. Behind me is Tappanov Hill, which means location-wise for this garden visit, it's pretty exposed. First generation farmers James Reed and Rosa Bevan run a small market farm at the foot of Tappanov. They grow vegetables for a community veg box scheme and raise free-range chickens for eggs. Their eight acre farm has been developed using permaculture principles. So permaculture design originated in Australia in the 1970s and comes from the words permanent agriculture. And this was in response to the fact that at that time we were starting to see a lot of negative effects from industrial farming taking effect on our, our water and our soils etc. So permaculture was the antidote for some of these problems. So what makes you different here then? It's the design. While we use organic standard methods for, for growing our veg, it's how we start to plan our farm or our gardens that makes the difference. It's about where we plant the carrots rather than how we grow them. Okay, so how do you decide where you put everything? For example, why the polytunnel there? Sure, well we use a technique called zone planning. Um, in permaculture we have five zones. The first zone is centered around the house where we, where we spend most of our time and that's our most intensive area because we visit it often. So we want to plant our salads there, our herbs, things that we want to get quickly if we need to. And I'd say that's the same principle when you've got a, a garden. I'd say to people, yeah, you want your herbs by of the course, house. Of course, you could have your herbs by your house, but you could also have an area left alone for wildlife, which in permaculture would be our zone five. It's a place where we observe rather than cultivate. Okay, so why did you decide to go this route? Well, there are a lot of great examples of permaculture gardens and farms in the UK, but there are not too many that are using these ecological design techniques and methods to actually farm with. And that's something that we really want to try and get done here. So you want to practice what you preach, and mm. it's Rosa that's doing all the work <laughs> at the moment. Uh, so what are you up to? Uh, I'm just preparing a bed for seeding some carrots. I noticed that um, you know, you're not actually digging the soil, and Jim and George are doing a little um, trial on dig, no dig. Is it similar? Well, this is a broad fork, and it enables us to practice minimum tillage. This helps us to aerate the soil quite deep down without having to turn it. Um, it encourages the roots of different vegetables to grow down straight instead of to the side, which means that we can plant them quite close together. Now, I so. know that you grow a wide range of vegetables because yeah. you have a veg box scheme. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's just a small local scheme. So it runs for 22 weeks out of the year, uh, about 50 customers. And it starts in July but ends in late November. That's quite a long season, isn't it? It is, but we've got a lot more work to do before we get to that point. <laughs> so a wee bit of preparation first yeah. and then we'll see some sowing going on. Yeah, let's yeah. get to it. Now James, that's a brilliant tool for taking out drills and, you know, anyone in the garden could do that. Of course, this is just a regular bed preparation rake. But handy little tip, we've put these plastic tubes just cut from 
all piping that we had around the farm at certain intervals depending on the spacings you want to achieve between your plants and this helps you get a nice straight line. And are all the beds the same size? That's right, all our beds are 75 centimetres by 15 metres long. So that standardisation just keeps us in check, keeps us able to use the same fabrics every year. And it's very intensive because what, you're getting five rows of carrots? Yeah, this is something that we're experimenting with here which is biointensive farming. Biointensive is where we try and grow a large amount of crops in the smallest area of land possible. So by putting our vegetables very close together with nice deep soil, we get to use the natural growth of the vegetable to suppress the weeds because we're basically forming a canopy. Um, that also keeps in moisture in the soil. This is a, a new addition, the polytunnel? Yeah, just a month old. We got the skin on a month ago. It's been a big difference since then. Well, I think it's always nice to have a polytunnel. Yeah. Of course, it extends the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've been able to offer a few extra weeks this season. And yeah. also you can grow things that need a bit of protection, yeah. like the courgettes. Yes, exactly. So we were messing around a lot with cloches last year, so this is going to make a big difference to our time. I've yeah. also noticed it's the same sort of setup as outside. Yeah. You've got sort of five rows of veg going on, very intensive. These five plots here were just the same before the polytunnel came along. We've just plonked the polytunnel on top of them and we're growing in exactly the same way as we were outside, yeah. just with a bit more control. Well, back to the courgette. Yeah. You've obviously got to be quite organised about knowing how much you can grow. Yeah, so we've been able to pre-plan the exact number that we've needed to sow for everything. That's because we operate as a CSA farm, which is a community supported agriculture. That means we get a commitment from our customers from the beginning and it's so useful to us to have that. I'm quite interested because you're sowing them quite late. Yes, we are. Yep. I mean, our first veg box is the 29th of June, so it's reasonably late on and we don't need to have courgettes by you know any time before that we don't want to have any wastage that's mm. part of the csa model as well so we only want them to be ready for that time it's not too late to sow them if you don't want them really really early yeah well you that's know? a great yeah. point to make that people can still sow them especially yeah. if they've got somewhere undercover exactly now james this is quite a construction thanks yeah it's a hotbed propagator so we've made this mostly from recycled materials and essentially it's just a large compost heap. So recycled pellets mm -hmm. and what's gone on inside? Well, we've put manure in here, fresh manure mixed with straw is one of the best things to create that bacterial heat. This was getting to about 70 degrees when we first wow. made it. We've got it's obviously this. working very efficiently. Yeah, I'm going to stick that compost thermometer in there. And, um, Am I going to see the temperatures rise? Yeah, oh, you no, will. I can see that going up already. Yeah. That's amazing. So it's about 60 degrees now. So a lot of the heat's burnt off and a lot of the ammonia that can be released through from the chicken manure has yeah. burnt off. We've got the plants in their trays quite a distance hovering above the, the heat. So yeah, so they're not getting the 60 degrees, no. but they're getting enough because it's so crucial at the germination stage to have that heat. And I love the fact that you're not having to pay for electricity. Yeah, that's right. This is essentially an electric hot mat. And, you know, we're looking forward to the fact that this is going to be heating this polytunnel and potentially keeping the risk of frost away. And um, the end result being some really great compost that we can add to the beds behind us here as their source of fertility. So that's double recycling. Then. Double recycling, yeah. Very good. <laughs> I never thought I'd be milking goats. This is definitely a first for me. So tell me, it's all very well milking goats, but what's this got to do with gardening? <laughs> <laughs> well, all of the animals on this farm feed back into the garden in a way. Um, we use the manure from the ducks, the chickens and the goats, but we also make use of our waste products through all of them. So whilst we can throw some of our scraps from the garden into the chickens, into their run, and they make uh, compost, we also found that the goats' favourite food happen to be docks, which are our really? main weed. Um, and that's a huge problem. Yes. Uh, so what, do they graze on them? They won't go yeah. right down to the roots? They won't take the root, no. But we figure if we keep grazing them on the same patches, that they're going to reduce the weed pressure over time. What I want to do is actually come back when you're harvesting some of your veg That'd boxes. We'd love to have but you. I still need a bit of practice, don't I? <laughs> you can do it next time as well. <laughs> Here we go again. Hmm? I'm back.
back at Rhiney in rural Aberdeenshire, where it's harvest time at Tappan North Farm. This season we're following James Reid and Rosa Bevan, who run their market farm at the foot of Tappan North Hill. They grow vegetables for a community veg box scheme, which runs for 22 weeks of the year, from the end of June. Now these are lovely, Rosa. Yeah, these are actually the ones that we were sowing when you came here two months ago. That's incredible, they've done so well. But I mean, we have yeah. had a really good season, haven't yes, we? Yes, it's been pretty hot, just so like today. The varieties that you're growing? Because yeah. I mean, this is a very distinctive one with the stripes. Yeah, that's Cocozelle. Um, and then this dark one that we've got here is called Nero. Now, um, do you crop, obviously you've got a few marrows, you're not worried mm -hmm. what sort of size that you're cropping them at? No, I mean, we just crop everything that's ready one week and then we divide that up between our members because um, they've already bought a share of what we're harvesting. So. And how many boxes? 40 this year, um, but we could supply 50 and that's from just under a quarter acre of beds. You see, that's yeah. not a large area, isn't it? It's amazing no. how productive it can yeah. be. Yeah. Well, look, I'm going to leave you to crop more courgettes and marrows and I'll see what James is harvesting. Great. Cool. James, this looks amazing, beetroot. Yeah, these are growing really well this year. This is Choggia. Um, is that one of those, like, sort of stripy it varieties? It is, it is. We've got one here, that's what it looks like. Oh, wow, it's, it's really lovely, beautiful. isn't it? Yeah, it's great, it's great. When they're young, you can eat them raw, and get to this size, they're lovely to cook. It looks like a stick of rock to it me. It does. And now, the preparation here, you're separating the tops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sometimes we leave them on, because when they're, when they're young, these can be, they're nice and tender to eat as a vegetable in themselves. But today we're taking them off, and mostly because we've got such a full box at this time of the year that we can't fit the greens in the box as well. So we're going to be feeding these to the hens. All the goodness from these leaves will make their way into the, to the eggs as well. What about the beetroot? Do you wash those before they go in the boxes? Yeah, we do. These will go to the washing station and we'll just blast off the soil uh, just to clean them up a bit and, and so people don't get a whole bunch of soil in their boxes. And then they'll get uh, weighed. And, and separate it all out into the individual boxes. Presumably you're having to do quite a bit of watering. Yeah, with this sunshine that we've been having for the last month or so and the fact that we've hardly had any rain, we're, we're watering it potentially every night for an hour and a half. Well, a lot of these brassicas are looking very healthy, but I do see there's some gaps, and I'm assuming you haven't harvested yet. No, uh, unfortunately, we went through a bit of a crisis a few weeks ago. Uh, we had a new pest that we'd never experienced before, which is uh, the cabbage root fly. Oh, yes, that yeah. can be troublesome. Yes, very troublesome. So it took out quite a lot of our plants. Uh, it lays its eggs just in the base around Little the... Little maggot. Yeah, and then they migrate down, and the maggot feeds on the um, root system. So I think it's a shame, isn't it? Because obviously you've got the fabric down to suppress yes. the Louise, but you've taken out this little hole mm -hmm. and that's where they've gone. But you've found a way to kind yeah. of save some of them. Buying 700 cabbage collars <laughs> wasn't really an option no. for us. And James's mum kind of came to the rescue. I asked if she could help make these cabbage collars from our old feed sacks. So she cut out a number of circles and squares. Several hundred. <laughs> yeah, not just a number, several <laughs> hundred, yeah. Um, and we crawled in these nets and put them around all the bases to try and protect from any of the new generations of flies coming back down and laying their eggs in the soil again. And also using the yellow sticky trap. Yes, so that was to kind of reduce the numbers of the inevitable hatching flies that were going to come from the maggots that were already in the soil. So we made sure to put them on the inside of this mesh so that none of the kind of bees or other oh, pollinators... All the pollinators, yeah, that's quite important, doesn't it? So, um, and we hope that that reduced them and kind of you know, you want to break the, the life cycle. So, I mean, another year, you could still use mm. the landscape fabric, but yeah. just take out a cross. Exactly. Don't yeah. remove anything. And yeah. a finer mesh? A finer mesh would be great, because this is great for the cabbage white. If we have a finer mesh, it will block this. It's basically, essentially, a small house fly kind of size. It will block it from getting in in future. So we're here in a comfrey patch in the market garden and um, we grow a lot of comfrey on the farm for a multitude of reasons. So garden. what do you use it for? I mean, has this been cut back already? Yeah, this was cut back a couple of months ago and as, as you can see, it's, it's flowering again already and really great for the bees. The bees absolutely love it. So, so we do make a fertilizer. We, we, we chop this down at ground level and um, stick it into a wheelie bin, pour some water in there and let it ferment for a couple of weeks before we, we use it. 
Comfrey is actually classed as a dynamic accumulator, so it's very you have good. You to say that again. A that dynamic accumulator. Uh -huh. Yeah, so Comfrey has massive tap roots. What that means is that the Comfrey can access different minerals and nutrients from deep down in the soil levels and that fruit trees can't access. And when we cut this down and lay it around the fruit tree, of course, the biology in the soil can make that available for the tree. So it's a brilliant plant to have in the garden. It's great, yeah. So here's Rosa adding some vegetables to the box. Hey. And that's it completed. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a finished box. And um, it's really it's colourful, I have to say, with the shard. That looks beautiful. Yeah, yeah, this is a regular size box. It's got about eight varieties, different veg here. Some beetroot, uh, broad beans, radish, rainbow chard, mixed salad. Absolutely wonderful, because the great thing is that it's chemical free. It's fresh right. and uh, you just get such a range of vegetables. So, but presumably over the 22 weeks, that is going to change throughout the season. It will, it will, because we only, can, we only grow what we can grow in season here. And sometimes there'll be a glut of something and sometimes there might be a slight shortage in, in one crop. But hopefully our, our members will understand that. And the thing is, I'm looking forward to coming back about sort of autumn time yeah. and see what's going on then. I but agree. thanks very much. Cool, thank you. I'm at Rainey in rural Aberdeenshire, back to visit Tap of North Farm for the last time. And well, with the temperatures definitely dropping and also the daylight hours getting shorter, I'm here to see what preparations are underway for the autumn and the winter. This season, we've been following James Reed and Rosa Bevan, who run their market farm. They grow vegetables using organic methods for a community veg box scheme which runs for 22 weeks of the year. So this is a box at this time of year for us. Um, it's a little bit different than the last time you came. So we have cabbage, calabrese, and these are some of the carrots that we sowed the first time you came in May. No sign mm. of carrot root fly? No, we were really lucky with that actually. And what about the courgettes? Now, I think we were sowing those back in May time. Yeah. Is it the same plant? Yes, yeah. So we've just got one row of them left here. These are pretty much just tailing off now, so we don't have quite enough of them for the boxes anymore. So that's them gone on until now. They've been really productive, yes, which is great. They have. Now, we've got to think about the fact that you've still got several weeks to go. Mm. So the polytunnel must be great for extending the season. It is, it's, yeah, exactly. I mean, we're still learning how to use a polytunnel. We've never grown indoors before, but we're trying to do some salads. We've got some spinach growing in the background there, which should be ready for the veg boxes. And what about the hotbed? Have mm. you been using that compost? Yeah, we have. So all the manure that went into that hotbed has now made its way onto the beds and the polytunnel. So it was just enough compost really to give a, a, a good mulch to all the beds. And what about the preparations for sort of late autumn into the winter? Yeah, so to put the garden to sleep in winter, um, we take most of our kind of crop, the vegetation from the crops off, and then we cover over the beds with silage tarp. That creates a kind of warm, moist environment that helps the vegetation break down, adds organic matter to the soil, and then uh, prevents erosion over the winter. And then in spring, as we take them off and we go to plant the beds up, we've got much less weed pressure as well, which really helps us with our workload. Yeah, and of course, all the goodness goes back into the soil. Yeah. And are you working then pretty much on the principles of no dig? Getting yeah. there. We try. We'd like to, <laughs> yeah. James, tell us what's going on in this bed. Well, this is where we're dedicating uh, an area to growing fruit in the market garden so that we can potentially have top fruit and soft fruit available for the veg boxes. And different layers. Yeah, so what we've done, the design that we're working with is trying to mimic the natural structure and architecture of a forest. So we have um, tall species of trees like apples and plums. We've got the shrubs like the raspberry and blackcurrant, the autumn olive right down to ground cover, herbaceous like the comfrey and mint. You mentioned uh, autumn olive. That's I it. don't know that. Yeah, not a lot of people have heard of this one. So this is it here. It's from Asia originally. It's autumn olive, which is um, Eliagnus umbellata. As well as producing an edible berry, it's a nitrogen fixing shrub. So it takes nitrogen from the atmosphere, makes that available through its roots into the soil, which then acts as a nurse crop for the trees um, and shrubs that we have surrounding it. You've got some of the berries. We do. 
So can I have a little taste? Because this sure, is something I never like. They're lovely, actually. It looks they're like beautiful. they've got like golden glitter on yeah. them. So are, you, are you meant to eat them? Well, raw? you can do. You'll you'll see. They can be a little bit tart. In fact, this is a. <laughs> hey, mm, but actually, they're zingy. They're not quite zingy. Yeah. They're quite nice. Well, this is a this is a named variety called sweet and tart. Mm. Um, but ideally, you'd probably want to make these into jam or fruit leather. They remind me a little bit of red currants, actually. Yeah, yeah, they like really that. Really nice. Yeah. And the fruit trees, have they done quite well this They've year? They've done great. I mean, we've only, this is, we only established this uh, tree row a year and a half ago. We managed to get a great amount of plums and apples this year. I'm sure people will have noticed, though, that it's a pretty windy site. Mm. Shelter belts must be quite important. Definitely. That was one of the main design criteria that we had, was creating microclimate by putting in some shelter belts and hedgerows. So we've been mostly working with willow and a hybrid willow because it grows a lot faster. And we, we started taking our own cuttings about five years ago and propagating them around the entire farm. So the ones I'm looking at over there, is that all the growth they've put on this That's year? That's right. So they, they were coppiced, as in cut down to ground level um, in April. And that's the growth. Incredible. Now we've seen yourself and Rosa working really hard. But your mum does quite a bit of work around yeah, here too. Yeah, definitely. Mum's fantastic. We're, we run this place as a family small holding. So um, mum's always in the background doing the hard work, packing the veg boxes for us while we're harvesting. Rosa, I know yourself and James are very keen on your recycling. Yeah. So using a couple of bars for making wormeries. Yeah, well, they're a great scale for us, really. You can have uh, smaller wormeries for a more of a home scale, but for us, this works great. We've built them on a slight angle yes. uh, with the plug hole at the, at the lower end. And then we would just fill with gravel and then a layer of this landscape fabric. And then we just filled it with manure. And then we bought two kilos of tiger worms and uh, we've split them between these two baths and they feed on the manure. And then that um, means you get the liquid? Yes, exactly. So we take that, collect it in a bucket and we dilute it 10 to 1 and use it as a liquid feed. What um, about the compost itself? Let's have a look and yes, see if we can yes, find course, these so tiger worms because I know size. as soon as you reveal them with the light yeah. they want to disappear. The, yeah, they kind of run away. So they look a bit different to your, you know, the earthworm that you would see um, more commonly in the Quite soil. Quite narrow, yeah, small. narrower, smaller, re a lovely reddy colour. So yeah, we've talked so. about the concept concentrate yeah. but you can also use the compost yeah so if we take away kind of the fresh layer and then you can see these kind of a, a very rich thing made up of worm casts basically you could put it in your uh, potting mix for your seedlings and you could add it as a kind of concentrated mulch to a plant um, so yeah so that's great um, and also another use we haven't done it with ours yet but we could they multiply obviously with all this food so yes. They could be a great feed for the chickens. You or know, you could give them to them somebody out. else to make or their own Or we could give them to someone else, slightly less you? gory. Yeah. Brilliant. Shall we put it back? Okay, yes. So since you were last here, we've had a couple of kids. Is this um, P? This is the one that I think I was stroking, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, this is P here. This is the one that you milked. Yeah. Um, Mandy there is the mum. Yeah, so we've got two more new goats on the farm. They're lovely. New and I mean, what, just a couple of months old? They're quite a yeah. size, aren't they? I know, they've grown hugely. It's probably all these cabbages. Which again is the excess of the plant. Exactly, yeah. Nothing goes to waste, so no. we really recycle well, everything. And we've been feeding them the willow yeah. branches when we've coppiced willow. A lot of that comes down to the goats as well. Well, you know, I've had a fantastic time. My third visit, I've enjoyed every visit. Your third year with the vegetable box scheme? Yeah, yeah. Well, long may it continue, because I think it's a great idea. Thanks and so this much. is the kind of kid that I could take home. <laughs>